What's up, everybody? I am Jamie Bedingfield. This is Too Many Words, my podcast, a community for readers and writers and dreamers. Welcome to the show. You guys rock for tuning in. I have just an awesome conversation with author and editor Catherine Locke for you guys this week. We get really into revisions and process and, uh, yes, good stuff. I'm excited to share it. I'm going to get to it very shortly. I just had a couple of things. Patreon supporters, you'll find a new book post all about the books I've been reading and will be reading with some hints about future guests. And also, Friday is the first of the mini episodes. Every Friday, you can find uh, short rambling from me on Patreon. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, I've been looking forward to adding that. So, definitely keep an eye out. And I wanted to read an email that I got from a listener to Naya. I guess I got her permission. Thank you for uh, saying it was cool that I could read it. I. Uh, this email brought uh, smiles and good feelings, uh, it's, so I, I wanted to share it with you. Hey Jamie, I've been listening to your show since the first time you had Richard Cadre on. I was just ending a relationship with someone who didn't support my writing aspirations or really me at all, and finding you while building your writing career and your real conversations with some of my favorite authors has become uh, the friend I needed over the last year and I, I just started querying my manuscript and I wanted to say thank you. Wow, wow, Tanea, uh, thank you so much. It means uh, just so much to hear that and I'm so happy that Too Many Words has been there for you. And writing is hard and community is so important and so helpful and you know I've discovered that in, you know, my writing endeavors, so it feels really good to um, hear that I'm doing that for you, because uh, I, it's giving back to the community that's helped me has been one of my goals, so thank you so much for reaching out, and uh, really, all, all of you are encouraged to share your thoughts and favorite books and writing struggles. You can email the show at too many words pod at gmail.com and of course uh, share your thoughts and ideas for the show on patreon.com slash too many words and reviews are always a great place to let me know what you like too on iTunes and Stitcher your support means so much to me and it helps the show grow and uh, helps people hear about it and uh, you guys rock for having my back and thank you again Tanea for reaching out your email uh, gave me the feels and uh, good luck with querying but yes I am really excited to, uh, to get to my talk with Catherine Locke she is the author of The Girl with the Red Balloon which won the 2018 Sydney Taylor Award she's also um, has the uh, District Ballet Company a series, um, which is contemporary romance. Catherine's range as a writer is amazing, and uh, she's uh, she's got a lot of gr- great things to say about the process and how to get things done. So after these notes, we are going to get to my talk with Catherine Locke. I'm in a weird mood. I just a couple hours ago, I finished this massive rewrite that has been on my brain for the better part of the last year. And I, I've just wow. got to the end of it. And it was one of those projects where I wasn't sure I would ever make it to this point. Congratulations, though. That's awesome. Thank you. But uh, yeah, I'm in a little bit of a fog. So there's that. <laughs> I I know that feeling very well. But it's, it's such a, um, it's just so intense, especially like, at least for me, when I get towards the end of a story, I get like, it is all that's on my brain. It's everything yeah. is encompassed by these events and the smells and all of that. So it's like, then you get to it and you close the document and it's like, you know, I feel like a lost puppy a little bit. I always feel like it's like being underwater in the ocean and then surfacing 
and then kind of being disoriented, like, oh, there's sky and a horizon now, because underwater there is no sky and there is no horizon. So yeah, it feels like surfacing where I like have to like turn in a circle and like remember how to breathe and like find the shoreline and kind of balance myself out again. Totally. I like that a lot. I spent a lot of time in the ocean as a kid, so I get I sometimes, I don't know, I return to the ocean for metaphors a lot. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, rightfully so. The ocean is, it's, it's, it's ripe for them. It is. So you've been working on that revision for a while. Is revision typically something that you work a lot on? Or do you, is revision an easy part of the process or a hard part of the process for you? Uh, in the past, um, it's, I, it's usually my favorite part because I get to fix it. But in this case, there was just so much broken that when I went to rewriting it, I mean, it was a overhaul. I only kept, you know, like 10,000 words. Wow. Um, and, you know, in order for me to get the story out, I just I had to flex a lot of muscles. It just in a way that I, I, I didn't do it in the previous version. So it was really challenging for me. So this revision was a special kind of challenging. I've never experienced anything like this before. That's awesome, though, that you were able to follow through because I've been there and it's really easy to be like, never mind, I will find something else right? to write. Yeah. Isn't it hard? Like, I have so much trouble, like, especially when I was like, okay, this is broken, this isn't working, and this is how to fix it. Then I have this voice that comes in my head and is like, is it really how to fix it? Or are you just, you know are you going the wrong way? And it's just, it's, it's so tough to juggle all those voices at that time. Yeah. And I find myself, I guess for me book, I I always feel like I find my books in my revision process. The girl with the red balloon, only three sentences survived draft one to draft two. Wow. And that was, I threw out like 92,000 words, um, which felt enormous at the time. And now I've done it for like three other books. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's what I do. I throw out words. But I also have to like check in with myself. So I'll be like, oh, this is a great idea. I will do this with this draft. But then I have gotten to the point where now I know to check in with myself, like that is a good idea. You should add that to your draft. But what is it fixing? What gap in the story do you think this plot device or this character or this scene is filling? And what are the other things that could do this to make sure that I have the right one so that I don't have to throw out two whole drafts? I'm just throwing out one whole draft. (laughs) That is, um, yeah, that is, that is a really good idea. And checking yourself, that's something I learned to do the hard way is that I went into the revisions. I was like, okay, wow. That's, and I started getting all these ideas and it's great. And I was piecing them together. I got about halfway through that version. I was like, this is not right. Also. Yeah. Yeah. I have done that with, I have been working on one book since NaNoWriMo of 2013. And that book has been like my white whale book (laughs) and I love it. But every time I come up with a new idea, I'm like, oh, this is how I should approach it. It hasn't been the right way yet. So I've done a lot of like, take a step back. What are the gaps in the story? And what are you actually trying to fix in this revision, which is really a rewrite. But if I call it revision, it seems less overwhelming. (laughs) Yes. Yes, it's true. Calling it a rewrite. Um, I was freaking myself out when I was doing that. I'm like, I'm rewriting this, the whole thing. This is a rewrite. Yeah. Yeah. That you can really get up in your head that way. Oh, totally. Well, and it's like, that's like something that I've been really working on is staying in like, okay, I need to do this thing right now and not think about all the things. Right. I revise in passes. And then at the end, I'll read through a, a draft, the whole draft and make a list as I go. Okay. I need this character's eye colors, like seven different colors throughout the book. <laughs> but there are also big things like this romantic subplot needs to be brought out more or the beats are all wrong I'm missing a beat between these two characters Um, and then that way I have like a to-do list and then I work through that to-do list and I always start with most structural to least structural so eye color I can fix really anytime it will never affect this how much I have to rewrite but if I spend all this time fixing dialogue between two characters when actually I'm ripping out that entire subplot that was a waste of time. So I always do the ripping out first. 
but I find that to-do list is super helpful for me. I have found that too, actually. And you're one of the people that um, have inspired me to do this, but uh, that bougie boarding is just a great way for me to like do to-do lists in a way that I'm like managing what I'm doing. Yeah. And it like something yeah, about the- it, it gets the creative juices flowing too. And it's amazing. I, so for people who be listening, the bullet journal or the bujo is how I do a planner, but I also find it as a creative outlet. I have a word tracker every week in my layouts and I also can do like story brainstorming in there. And, um, I like will jot down pieces of dialogue and all that type of stuff. I do all of my creative and life planning inside that journal. Super helpful to me. Um, so yeah, I'm glad that you also are finding it helpful. So helpful. I've really just adopted it in the last like four months or so. And it's mm-hmm. just it's just made such a difference. Yeah, I um I'm trying to think. I want to say it was Megan Erickson and Leah Riley, maybe, who turned me onto it almost two years ago. And it has oh my gosh. I was never a planner person when I was growing up. I found them really hard to focus and to complete. And then I would feel bad about missing a week. So then I give up on the whole thing Um, versus this. If I miss out on a week, like whatever, it doesn't matter Um, because I make the layout so I can also skip a week. I can just tear it out. It's not a big deal. And I don't feel like um, I've ruined all of it. (laughs) So yeah, it's been a really good system for me. It's definitely been helpful. Yeah, no, and I've been using it as, um, I don't know, I just uh, kind of separating my day. So I have things that I just basic like care things like have you gone out for a walk today? And it's yeah. like, really helpful, especially when I'm like, I'm juggling multiple projects. It's really easy for me to just forget to take care of myself. Yeah, I have a habit tracker now that I used to have like the full page one, but now I just put a mini one on my weekly spreads. And it's like, did you make lunch or buy lunch because I am trying to watch how much money I'm spending on my lunch every week. And so trying to bring more lunch to work. Did you take, go for a walk? Uh, did you take a day off? Cause I don't really take days off. So, yeah, yeah. um, I track how many days off I take and, um, travel and events and words and editing and, um, I I'm trying to reduce the amount of sugar that I'm drinking. So did I drink less than X number of grams of sugar that day? So that's been really helpful to me as well. Um, Because it also reminds me like, if I'm like, Oh, I can't believe I didn't get any words done. Oh yeah. I traveled three of the four days that I had set aside for writing this week. Um, So it reminds me to like, take it easy on myself. Like there's a reason I didn't get much writing done. No, that has been, I, I noticed that in mine too. It's like, because it's really easy to lose track of what you actually did do. I do this all the time. I I focus on what I did not get done mm-hmm. versus what I did do. So it's like, yeah, it's I can see it right there. It's like, okay, well, I didn't hit my word count, but I was not home for six hours today. Right, right, exactly. Like, at least then you can see like, oh, I was really busy and that's why my word count went down. And um, it's helpful for planning, but it's also helpful to give yourself a break which is really important. And creative types are notoriously bad at this. So I'm finding that. Yeah, no, I'm terrible at giving myself a break and taking time off. I, I took a week off and it was my first week off in, in months. And it took me half the week to like, disengage my brain. Yes. Yep. That sounds familiar. <laughs> so yeah, because there's, there's all these angles. So it's like, it almost feels like, I can, if I focus on something enough, I can figure out exactly the answers that I need. Thus, I've solved the problem. It's it's a tricky loop, even though like a theoretical problem, not even like a tangible one. Yeah, yeah. So you said that you kept only a couple sentences from the girl with the red balloon. Is yes. <laughs> is, ha- is having multiple perspectives something that you started out with or did you come to that? That's a good question. Um, I came to that. So the first draft was written entirely in Ellie's point of view. And the basic premise was the same. Girl accidentally time travels to 1988 East Berlin. Um, In that version, it started in January. And the current version, she gets there in March. 
And um, the bulk of the book was pretty different. Um, there were a couple characters who I ended up cutting because they just didn't really have a purpose. Kai's role is what Sabina's role is in the final draft. So Interesting. Ka- yeah, everyone's always like, really? How did you reconcile a romance with that? <laughs> uh, that didn't work. That's why it changed. Um, he did have a sister and she did like exist and she was a balloon maker, but um, she just didn't have a pivotal role. Um, Ellie had been arrested by the Stasi and had to be like magic out of jail. Oh, wow. Uh, and there was a magical circus, which is how Ellie found out about her grandfather. And so like, obviously all of that changed and I gave her knowledge about her grandfather's escape and all of his life prior to her coming or accidentally time traveling. So all of that changed just because the book wasn't working the way it was. It like wandered too much. It didn't really have a focus or a purpose. And it was about a year between drafts one and two. So I finished draft one. I started writing it in February, 2013. I finished it April something 2013 and immediately knew that like I had been sending chapters and pieces to my critique partners and we all knew like I had to set that aside and really think about it it was good like there was something there I just didn't know what yet and then I wrote um, second position next and that was what ended up being my first book out I wrote that next, and then I wrote that 2013 NaNoWriMo book I told you I'm still working on. (laughs) Um, And then the following year, in 2014, I was querying second position, which was then called Serenade. And then I was, I started rewriting The Girl with the Red Balloon. And this time I worked off an outline, and I knew exactly where I was going. I I worked literally right through the outline. It came together very quickly. I wrote the second draft in about a month. and I sent it out to my critique partners and they all were like this now you have it it took you that year of thinking about it and brainstorming and trying to rewrite it but this is it um so it has not changed very much at all from the draft that I wrote in um spring of 2014 oh wow yeah it was that draft was that was it that's exciting yeah that was pretty cool is is there like a point in like is it the middle or towards the end where like it's like serious gut check time for you when you're going through? Like, is there a part that you really need to really need to chug, chug through? So I hit points where I think that everything's going wrong. I don't actually know how to write a book and <laughs> yep. I don't understand what to do next. And I hit them pretty much at the same point of every novel. Um. I will hit them at about 10,000 words and then again at about 27,000 words and then at about 40,000 words, I'll panic that I don't have enough plot left. And it's true. My first drafts are usually very short. Um, I would say not the girl with the red balloon that for some reason had a long draft each time. Um, But the first draft of the spy with a red balloon, which comes out this fall was like 51,000 words. And the final draft is 104,000 words. Oh, wow. So, yeah. So I'm getting better at being like, okay, yes, this is your 40,000 word panic. However, it is not necessary to like lie down on the Barnes and Noble floor and cry because you have been here before. (laughs) You know that you're going to go back and revise and put in subplot and character development and all of these things that you skipped. Um, so I'm getting better at knowing that, but that's pretty typical for me. I hit, uh, I would say like every, definitely at 10,000 words, I'll be like, wait, what is this book again? And then at 27,000 words, I'll be like, it's the ugly middle. <laughs> and then at 40,000 words, I'll be like, oh my God, I don't have a plot. And then I just get to the end because I, I make myself finish a book before I start rewriting it. Oh, yeah. Just because for me, if I get stuck in a rewrite cycle, which is kind of where I am with the 2013 nano book, is that I just, I will stop at the same point every draft and start again from the beginning. And I just kind of get stuck in this rut. So I really try to make myself finish the draft before I still rewrite. And I definitely, the second draft is always better. 
I, I outline, I reverse outline, I use note cards and I have tried doing that before I start writing and I'm always going to need to do it after the first draft. Something radically changes with books when I write them. Um, I figure out the point of them. I figure out what the heart of the book is and I can think I know that before I go into it, but I always, it always changes in the writing for me. Yeah, I'm I'm very similar in that I'm finding it, and I need to have, you know, I need to know, I need to have a sense who my characters are and where I'm going. And I think I know where I'm going, but so much gets developed as I get there. And some of the my favorite things are things I didn't plan, things I find along the way. Yeah, I, Benno, who's Ellie's grandfather, the girl with the red balloon, I didn't plan his his point of view really? in that outline that I was talking about that I worked straight through it. I didn't plan his point of view. And somewhere along the way in that second draft, I was like, Oh, I need to give him a point of view too. And, in, and wrote that separately and inserted it, it into the book. But that was something I was like, this doesn't make sense without grounding it in this other family history. Like she can't just keep talking about the family history without us seeing it. So that was something I discovered along the way with the girl. And uh, with my book, Second Position, it, <laughs> the first draft had a stalker in it. And Allie was, like, kidnapped. And Zed had to go save her. And my critique partners were like, what? <laughs> what is happening? Like, I still have it in my email. Like, the original title was Everything Between Us. And um, it'll say, like, EBU uh, minus the stalker draft. Um <laughs> And then once I pulled that out, I was like, oh, this is a much more coherent book. It actually makes sense, um, but it's really short. What is it missing? And then I was like, oh, therapy. Like, this is a book about people who are grieving and depressed and have eating disorders and anxiety. And she obviously goes to therapy. And so I had talked about her going to therapy, but then I put in the therapist. And suddenly it was a a novel length and b like felt like a complete story then i had connected that last dot um so yeah i always find something along the way and as i just explained usually it's another point of view for me yeah no i find it really interesting that um benno was a surprise for you he was one of my favorite parts it's just i, know. Uh, I mean I... it was heart wrenching and um just the the layer of emotion and depth that it adds to the whole book is just um it's amazing thank you I was so worried about that point of view I really thought that people would I I up until publication day I was like oh people are just going to flip past these chapters this is not going to be interesting to people um I think it's important to the story but I just don't see it's a very different voice. It's a little like more sparse. Um, Benno's a really hard character to connect with deliberately. And then people are always like, oh my gosh, like Benno was so important. And I just really like the scenes with his sister and the girl on the other side of the fence and blah, blah. I'm like, oh, I did not expect that reaction, uh, which is true. I mean, like he, he is the core of the story. He's if the book was a wand, he's the phoenix feather. Yes. And uh, <laughs> I love that. I love that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I'm really glad that people have found meaning and they've connected with with his parts of the story. Um, it's you know it's just like ten thousand words of the story, and it was really important to me. And that, other than copy editing, that really didn't have many revisions. The way that I wrote it is the way that it ended up being printed. Um, and I think that I really was willing to go there and to write it differently than I wrote the rest of the book so that I didn't have, I, I couldn't revise it. It was too emotionally hard for me <laughs> to go back in. And I think I knew that. So I think I was like, you're going to get this right on the first try because you're not going to be able to read this anymore. And I, one of the parts of the book that I read when I go to schools and do events is one of Benno's chapters. And every time I read it, I have no memory of writing oh, wow. his chapters at all. Like 
they're so hard for me to read and they're so hard for me to reread and to think about. And I don't know that I could rewrite them now the way that I did that first time. Like I tapped into something and then that door closed. <laughs> um, I really remember writing all of the other parts of The Girl with the Red Balloon. But yeah, Benno's is hard. Benno was really hard for me to write. Um, did you write all, like his part all together? I, so I wrote Benno, every chapter of Benno's, I wrote in a separate Word document. Okay. Um, so I knew the beats that I wanted to hit with him. So I, when, once I knew I needed to write him, I wrote down like, okay, here are the, he has like six or seven chapters. Um, here are the, the seven things that I want to touch with him. Uh, and I wrote all of those a separate Word document. And worked with my agent a lot on where to insert those properly so they'd have the right emotional resonance with the rest of the story. And then my editor and I moved a couple of those around uh, for the same reason. And then with Ellie and Kai, I wrote straight through, but I wrote them in separate Word documents. So I had like a master story document and every day I'd open up a new Word document, write Ellie, um, you know, sneaking out of the house to and, and trying to follow Mitzi to the park, would save it and then copy paste it into a, a master document and then go to Kai's point of view. Um, so I, I did write straight through. I did alternate them. But moving from it was easier for me to switch voices if I had a fresh word document to Interesting. work in. So I am reluctantly, extremely reluctantly using Scrivener now for the same purpose. <laughs> Um, but I, I still love working in Word. So right now I'm working on a new book that I can't talk about it all. Sorry, but, um, I am writing it in Word and then copy pasting it into Scrivener and letting, and then I'll compile at the end, but I'm just writing everything in Word and then copy pasting it. It is not a great process, but it does help me keep voice straight. And in this book, it's one point of view in the main timeline and then the characters' journals, or so the characters' fathers' journals. So it helps to write them in separate places and then put them into a master document or Scrivener. Interesting, isn't it funny how you have to like find these little tricks to to get yes. it all to work? <laughs> I feel like my writing process is super inefficient. <laughs> I mean, I am obsessed with talking about process. I could talk about process with other writers all day. Me too. Um, <laughs> all I want to do is call up my writer friends and be like how do you write chapters? How do you end chapters? Like, what is your decision process like around the end of a chapter? And nobody has that kind of time for me to call them every day with this. But yeah, I mean, I feel like my process is super inefficient, but it works. Like I finish books. So I'm right now I'm like, well, as long as it's working, I'm going to keep going. Yeah, no, I mean, that's it. If it works, I for the long, you know, and I knew this about myself, I, I have so much trouble thinking on screen. Mm -hmm. uh, so I do everything on paper. I write it all out on paper. I print out the edits and do it on paper. And then I put it back into the computer. Talk. That is not the quickest <laughs> way to do it. <laughs> but it works. Exactly. And then there, there was a point where I was like, no, I can't do, I'm not moving fast enough. And I abandoned my process in hopes of, you know, thinking like, okay, I want to do it quicker because I'm going to go right on the computer. Nope. I tried, I am writing a middle grade and I um, tried to change my process for it. And the middle grade was like, nice try, but I still need an outline. After like a year of trying to write it without an outline and being like, I'll let the story take me. Nope. I need an outline because I keep getting stuck at 30,000 words and being like, what happens next? And 30,000 words in a middle grade is definitely the 40,000 words of uh, young adult. Oh, definitely. So it's like mentally or uh, like plot arc wise, it's the same point in the story. Um, so I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's my fault for thinking I could outsmart my own brain. That didn't happen. So when you outline, do you like you heavily outline? You know what every like yeah. point A to point B to point C, what everybody's doing. Yes. So. I learned to outline for Nano 2013 for that book that I'm still rewriting. And I, my, the current young adult novel that I'm working on, the one with the single character point of view and her father's journals, I have an 83,000 
no, not 83,000. That would be like a book. Um, I have an 88,300 word outline. It's the synopsis, but it's really long. It isn't like six pages or something like that. Uh, seven pages, maybe. Um, it's very long. And it's very detailed. It is like, she sits down on the bed. She stands up. She follows him to the bathroom. She wraps her arms around his waist. It's very detailed because that's really helpful for me. Because then I can just move that synopsis into a new draft and, or a new Word document and just start using that as a zero draft to build off of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yes, my outlines are very detailed and very long and very unnecessary and extremely necessary all at the same time so i can't if i outline too much in the beginning i yeah i get in trouble like i the, yeah I end up putting things in that have no business being in i get away from myself i need like basically five points like my yeah my, my the midpoint is big for me i need to know what happens in the middle the point of no return mm-hmm. other than that i kind of have to just Get my, you know, I have my goals and all that stuff. I know kind of where I want my characters to go, but then I have to get there, and then I outline when I reread it. I do the reverse yeah. outline. So I, I feel like I do it. That eight thousand three hundred word outline came after like six months of work, <laughs> or more eight months of work on on the book idea. So like first I start with like a query. I, I'm agented, but every time I have a book idea, I write a query for it. If I can't write a query for it, the book isn't ready to be written. Um, and then from there, I wrote like a short 2000 word outline uh, because I was sending this in as a proposal. Um, and then from there, I might, it depends. I've successfully written books just from that type of outline where it is much more, I know my Maybe like I usually aim for like having 10 plot points that I know and then I can kind of connect the dots between them. But I have found that I still end up doing so much rewriting and I would like to do less rewriting. So I'm trying to go back to my old pre-publication method of extensive outlines that I really dig into and then can layer out in pieces. So, yeah, I guess my I mean. I've always had some sort of outline or touch points as a list and that's just how detailed it is changes. Um, But I understand, like, I think unless I am super passionate and can write that those passion points into the outline, there's always a risk when you outline that you've, you've um, overstructured yourself. So you no longer have that creative moment where you're like, I'm on a roll. Yeah. But I still, I still figure out, things as I go. So I have that enormous synopsis I'm working off of. And then the other day I was halfway through a chapter and this character was like, oh, you know, because this happened to me. And I was like, what? That's not anywhere. (laughs) And oh, that makes perfect sense. It is actually there. I didn't see it from that angle before, but it does inform everything that you do now. Um, So there's still moments of surprise that I can find. Uh, And I really like that part of the process. I love those moments. Those moments where you get like that random thought and you're like, wait a minute. And then you're able to just like put it all together or your fingers are on fire. I just love it. I mean, it's like it's like that feeling like I hunt for it when I'm not there. It's like what I want. So when it's happening, it's like, yes, it's like I have magical light coming through my hands. (laughs) It is. It's so awesome. When you... When you're writing and you don't have that, what do you do to find that? Music is a big, big thing for me. Um, I make playlists around mood for individual characters. I have scary playlists when I'm like building, you know, tension. Uh, So I do. I rely on music a lot and uh, switching it up. So if I'm like, you know, not finding it, I have to either go for a walk or a bubble bath or um, write something completely different. I, I play with a little short fiction a lot for that reason. When I when I hit a wall with the book that I'm working on, I go and write a, something really weird that just, you know, just gets yeah. out and then I'm able to kind of find my way back to the, to the path. That's so interesting. I um, 
don't write a lot of short fiction. I am in an anthology that comes out this fall, and I'm editing my own anthology um, with Laura Silverman. Um, but short fiction is really hard for me, but I've, I've never used it to get out of one of those ruts. I end up just switching drafts, uh, which sometimes, if I'm not on deadline and no one's chasing me down for a draft, can mean I spend months jumping between drafts, and that can get really frustrating for me. Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, I think like part of the reason why jumping into the short fiction works for me is because n- nine out of ten times if I've if I've hit a wall of some kind or if I'm not inspired the way I need to, it's because I'm I'm I've stopped myself somehow and I don't know how because I'm not looking at it the right way. So going like <laughs> stepping away from um magical warfare and going to this disturbing creature that represents uh, a passed away father really helps me just shake some stuff loose. And I'm like, oh, okay, that's not working because the character wouldn't do that. I would do that. And then I'm back on track. Right, right. Yeah, I find that I end up when I'm stuck, I am very clean because I take tons of showers. Um, (laughs) And I do a lot of plot processing in the shower. Um, I really love long drives. Yep. Uh, those are like guaranteed to unstick me from a plot problem. Um, so I love taking long drives or going for a road trip when I am stuck, um, which is fun. I mean, not super environmentally friendly. None of my plot problem solving <laughs> yeah. methods Showering are particularly un- environmentally friendly, but they work. Uh, <clears throat> well, at least you're not getting your ideas by like spraying a lot of hairspray. No, I that guess. would be bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, even someone would have to be like, Katie, don't. <laughs> yeah. Stop. Put it down. Find another way. Obsessively, yeah. obsessively vacuuming for me is also like something that, I mean, not only like writing problems, it also solves like life problems. Like if I'm vacuuming, my solutions come to me. I wish that worked for me, and so does my room. (laughs) I just got a robot vacuum, though, so it's doing all of the plot solving for me. Oh, man. I love it. I highly recommend it for people who don't find that uh, vacuuming solves their plot problems. (laughs) Yeah, no, I can't get one of those. It would hurt me. Yeah, you definitely, you would never finish another book. No, yeah, that would be terrible. Because, yeah, my vac- my vacuum's just, you know. And plus, I'm also going to tire out all my dogs, so they're not going to need walks. No, my whole life will fall apart if I get a robot vacuum cleaner. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, so not a good, not a good holiday present for you. Got it. <laughs> oh, that's funny. <laughs> so The Spy with the Red Balloon comes out in the fall, you said, right? Yes, October 2nd. That's exciting. Are you? It is. It's super exciting. And can you get excited about it or are you trying not to think about it? Um, I'm a little more excited now than I was two months ago um, because I it is through copy edits. Okay. So it is, I am only going to see it maybe twice more and pretty quickly after this. Um, maybe just once more. I'm not actually sure. So... At this stage, I'm really excited because <laughs> I don't have to do anything more. Yeah. Um, it was a really exhausting book to write. It, and that's part of why I went back to writing really long synopses um, was that what my writing process for The Spy with Red Balloon was very exhausting. So it was hard for me to get excited about the book because I kept thinking about, and I obviously still think about how long it took that book to get in shape. but now I'm excited, and I do think that it ended up in a place that I'm really proud of, and my editor seems really proud of, and um, I am very excited to add it to kind of the YA lexicon. Um, I think that it's um, queer, it's historical, it's Jewish, it's magical. I think that it's it's the type of book I want to write, and that um, I learned a lot while I was writing it. And I think that it's something that doesn't currently exist out there. So I'm very proud of it for those reasons. And that makes it easier to get excited now. Yeah, no, that's awesome. That's exciting. I'm excited. I thank you. I am glad. I I really, um, I try to set like a goal for myself whenever I start a new book that 
I'm going to challenge myself in one way. And for Spy, I wanted to write something that was closer to being a thriller. Um, the Girl with the Red Balloon is really set up much more like a mystery. Yeah. And um, The Spy with the Red Balloon is much more like a spy thriller. So wow. I don't know that it's a genre that I am typically going to write, but I do feel like at the end, like, Hey, I learned how to write a spy thriller. I learned how to write a tighter plot. Um, and I am really proud of that, but I also got to write two leads that I really love Wolf and Elsa who are in the spy with the red balloon are a brother and sister. And so their dynamic together and to be in their heads is very different than Kai and Ellie and Benno. And it was just, really fun to explore that side and to have them be siblings like there's a moment where um they're they're behind enemy lines in germany it's slightly spoilery so but it's fine um they're behind enemy lines in germany in 1943 they're both jewish they're american and they do magic like they cannot get caught and wolf tells ilsa like to keep an eye out and she he says something like, at your at two o'clock, meaning at two o'clock, like on his side, but she looks at her two o'clock. And then they argue about it because that's what siblings would do. Like, well, you didn't say your two o'clock. You said two o'clock. So I thought it was my two o'clock. Um, totally. Because that's the most important thing that they have to argue about at that time, right? Um, it's definitely like what would happen if my brother, sister, and I were dropped behind enemy lines. <laughs> we would be very effective. And we would argue about things that weren't important. <laughs> um, so I had a lot of fun digging into that relationship and to get to write characters like that. That's awesome. Now, yeah. um, the the family bonds is a big theme in The Girl with the Red Balloon. Would you also say yeah. that, that that theme is present in The Spy with the, Rebel- the, Spy with the Balloon? The- Spy with the Red Balloon, Spy yeah. With the Red Balloon. Um, yes. I, they end up so the spy with the red balloon is the story of Wolf and Elsa Klein, who are Jewish American um, sister brother pair who can do magic, who are trying to fly under the radar. Except for Ilsa accidentally sets something on fire at a park um, using magic, and the person who from the government who knows they can do magic and is observing them is like, yes, you can no longer like go about your daily lives like you are a danger to society and we're going to either institutionalize you or we you can help us in the war so they get blackmailed into the war because of something ilsa does and because she wasn't listening to wolf so there's this tension ilsa feels very guilty about her role she also doesn't want to be involved in the war and wolf is also not keen on going to war but feels very guilty that he is an 18 year old boy who hasn't been drafted because he has a university deferment. So there's a lot of dynamics between them. Their father is a German immigrant. And so there's one point where he is threatened because of something that Ilsa is doing. Um, so all of that comes into play. And that is the sister brother bond is very important. There's when one of them is in danger, the other one does not think twice to use really dark, bad magic to go help them. It is not like a moment of consideration. Like, should I? Should I call the authorities and go through proper channels? No, I'm going to do this because my sibling is in danger. So that is a really important part of the book. Um, the siblings come up in The Girl with the Red Balloon between Kai and Sabina and with Benno and Ruth. And that was something that I hadn't really thought of. I mean, obviously I thought of brother and sister, but I hadn't thought of the ways that Kai and Sabina and Benno and Ruth are parallels to each other and girl. And then once I realized that I was like, oh, that's going to be the next book, the next book, I'm going to really dig into that sibling relationship under times of war and stress. It sounds really interesting. Thank you. <laughs> I, I could I could see though how because you said it was challenging to write. It sounds like yes. it it would be. Yeah, and again, I started. You think I would learn, but I started the book just from Elsa's point of view, and and it was like no, not, not yeah. This way I got either. to like the I got like twenty seven, twenty five, twenty seven thousand words in, and was like, 
what is it missing? Oh, it's not enough to say that her brother is abroad. I have to have his point of view. So then the next draft had um, Wolf's point of view, but he couldn't do magic. And then I got, again, like 27,000 words in and was like, this is wrong. Why is it wrong? And I was like, oh, they can both do magic. And they're both doing different things with their magic in war. Uh, And that's where the book started to come up together. But it was like almost a year of, I don't understand how their plots are connected. I really want to write the book this way, but I cannot figure out my way in. And it took me a long time. And like, again, like a year of brainstorming with other writers and with talking with my editor and talking with my agent and false starts to figure out my way into that story. So that was frustrating, but also a really good learning opportunity for me because I think if I hadn't been under contract, it would have been the type of situation where I put the book down and didn't finish it. But because I was under contract, I had to finish it. I had to figure out my way into this book. So it really taught me that if I keep at it, if I keep working, I will find my way into the book. That that will happen for me. It just takes a lot of grit and a lot of persistence and a willingness to keep showing up, even though it was very hard. Um, and then I, I have a new editor, and she is amazing. and she sees story so clearly and so interestingly. So once I had a working draft, we'll call it that. She'll probably laugh if she listens to this. We'll call it what I turned in a working draft. (laughs) Then we tore it apart again and went back into it several times pretty extensively. But it was one of those things where um, I learned a lot in the process and I'm very proud of that part. Even though, you know, your average reader won't know that, I'm very proud of that book, largely because it's done. <laughs> no, that's a really, that's a good feeling. And even though, because I'm just getting, I've learned so much. Like, there's weeks there that my, I swear my head hurt because I was just like, I was pushing, pushing myself like past where I could push myself. Yeah. And then I was getting comfortable and it was exciting because I was like, I can feel myself getting better and that's cool I love that feeling I really I seek that Mm -hmm. that I never want to feel like somebody who is like oh I know how to write this type of story so I'm just going to keep writing this type of story um I always want to be learning something new and challenging and figuring out my ways into harder and more complex stories but I also appreciate that I have people around me, both my critique partners and my agent and my editor who will say like, oh, the story you just told me about, that's too close to what you already know how to do that. That's too close to what you've already written. What's what's different about this? Like they'll push me to level up. That's awesome. Um, and I, I really appreciate it. It was actually one of the first things that my agent told me when we had our first call is that she was like, this book is good. The next book you send me needs to be better. And at the time I was like, how dare you? (laughs) And then I was like, oh, that's the best thing anyone said to me was this book is good. The next one has to be better. And now that's how I approach every single book. That's a good way to approach it. I think it works even if people are not agent and not, not under contract, not under deadline. They don't have external pressures. When you finish a book and you revise it and you polish it and it's as good as it's going to get and you send it out on queries or you self-publish it and you start to look at your next project even if you're writing like if I went back and wrote another romance romance hits certain beats it has to it's part of the genre right and then um I like tropes in my romance but even there with tropes and beats and a in a structure that I already know going into the book I want to make sure that something in my book, the prose or the pace or the character depth levels up in the next book that I work on. So, okay, this book was great. I'm done it. And the next book's going to be better. Uh, And I think that's the way that we grow. And it's the way that, um, you know, our industry and our genre and our communities grow. Definitely. Looking at projects that get, you know, get rejected with that eye. Like, you know, okay, this is what you have. What about it could be better? Exactly. 
Yeah. And what can I taking do those rejections what? and like really thinking about, okay, they said the voice didn't work. Voice is like one of those things that's really hard to tell what they mean by that when you get it from an agent. But going back and saying, okay, why didn't this book connect? Okay, I'm going to go write a book that connects. I'm going to focus on that. Like the pacing and the plot might not be the problem there. I'm just going to write a book that focuses on character and teach myself to write characters that connect. Um, description was a big thing that I needed to focus on. It's like getting the, getting that dis- that description in a way that is fluid with everything else and isn't slowing down the story, the right amount of description. Yeah. I just um, was talking to another writer the other day and he was like, how did you, how do you approach describing like the interiors of buildings and rooms that your characters are in? And I had to be like, I don't, that's a problem. I should probably work on that in my (laughs) next book. And I, that night when I went out to work on my, the draft I'm currently working on, um, I like sat down and was like, okay, Katie, you actually have to describe the buildings and the rooms and build this out a little more because previously I really described rooms where it was necessary to, to say like there was a table so that my character could sit and eat breakfast. But that was the extent of my description. And I was like, oh, yes, that is a weakness. I should work on that. Every piece of fiction is going to have a few of those. And it's just it's finding them and learning how to fix it and then a, a pro- you know, bringing that to the next project. Yes, exactly. Catherine, can you tell everybody where they can find you? Sure. I am on Twitter at Bibliogato, which is B-I-B-L-I-O-G-A-T-O. I'm on Instagram under the same name. And I am, uh, my website is CatherineLockBooks.com. I have a newsletter, usually goes out the beginning of the month. And I usually have a giveaway and Hopefully, I'll be able to share the first chapter of The Spy with the Red Balloon shortly with my newsletter subscribers. Ooh. Yeah. I'm going to subscribe. That'd be great. It's Seriously, I just give away a book. I talk about cats and writing, and I tried to share something about the book that I'm working on. Nice. I Really, I am so excited for The Spy with the Red Balloon. I've been telling everybody who will listen to me to read The Girl with the Red Balloon. It is one of my favorite books Thank that I read you. in the last year. Really just a beautiful uh, blend of magic and history. Just gorgeous. Thank you so much. I've really appreciated all of your support. Well, thank you um, so much for taking the time and coming on the show. I had a lot of fun talking with you. Yeah, this was a blast. Thanks so much for having me. All right, guys, that wraps it up for this week. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember to join the conversation on Twitter at Too Many Words Pod and me at me Bettingfield. Same names on Facebook, Jamie the Scribbler on Instagram. Be sure to support the show on patreon.com slash too many words and leave a review on iTunes, Stitcher, follow on Spotify, spread the word. You guys rock. Happy reading. Good luck writing. Be kind. And I'll talk to you next week. Over and out.